this is Jim. So I just started shooting NRL 22 quite recently, and suddenly I got very interested in the ballistics of 22 uh, bullets, because in NRL 22 you're shooting targets from 40 to say 200 yards at all sorts of different distances, and the targets are pretty small. And so to do it all well, you've, you really have to know the ballistics of your bullets. And unfortunately, um, books on textbooks on ballistics like Brian Litz's wonderful book, Applied Ballistics for Long Range Shooting, these books really focus on supersonic bullets and pretty much ignore the 22 and, and anything subsonic. Now, I can hope that Brian will will uh, fix that in the future edition of his book. But in the meantime, I thought it'd be interesting to use some public domain fluid dynamic software and just see what our bullets are doing. And so that's what I'll be sharing with you today. Now, I'm gonna be mostly focusing on these Ely match bullets just because that's what I normally shoot. Um, but I'll show you some other uh, bullet shapes uh, in a bit. Now you may be surprised when you see the shape of the bullet because uh, 22s are sort of weird. They have a, well, well the, the bullet diameter is the same as the outside diameter of the casing, which means there has to be an inner part of the bullet, um, which is called the, the heel that sits inside of the casing. And that's the part we don't normally see. But you'll see in all of these pictures of the bullets that there's a heel at the back end. Now the Ely match bullet, which is a patented design, is, is pretty interesting. It's a very short and stubby um, bullet with a, with a blunt front end. Here's a CAD um, drawing of the bullet. And um, I can't help but be reminded that front end reminds me a lot of, of the, some of the planes in World War II that of course were subsonic. They had very blunt noses. Um, but we'll see how that performs you know, in the simulations. So here's the first picture is uh, the Ely bullet um, going along very subsonic here. And the colorization is based on the speed of the air. And so the blue colors represent um, slowly moving air and the more reddish colors are uh, faster moving air. And you can see right in the front, there's a, a patch of a slow air it's filling in the front of the of the bullet and then there's also um, a boundary layer um, next to the bullet of, of relatively slow air and of course a, a wake of disturbed air behind the bullet if you take a look instead of velocity if you look at pressure the front of the bullet has a, a high pressure region and that's you know air that's been pressurized as it's hitting that very blunt front end and it's interesting when you zoom in on that front end, um, the the pressurized air basically makes a little cushion right there that has a streamlined shape. And the streamlines, those are those white lines, you can see that the air is smoothly flowing around the front of the bullet because of that cushion of pressurized air. So I my mind, that's pretty very, pretty clever. It's almost like the bullet were longer than it is, but we're making up the length with, with the air. Just for completeness, here's what the temperature of the air looks like. That pressurized air in the front, of course, is heated up by compression, but there's also a hot wake of air behind the bullet, and that's basically energy that the bullet is giving up to the atmosphere is slightly heating up the air as it goes through. And of course the bullet slows down because of that energy transfer. Okay, that was subsonic. Let's switch over. Imagine we shot that bullet at Mach 1.45, so 1,650 feet per second. Um, now things are a lot more dynamic here. There's a again a very high pressure region right in the front of the bullet which extends away from the, from the front and also off to the sides. That's because we're starting to create shock waves here. And it's a little easier to see when you look at the velocity of the air. So again, there's, a, there's decelerated air right in the front of the bullet. And of course, a little bit behind it as well. But you notice that the, the effects of that on velocity extend away from the bullet. 
And those are little shock waves that are being created as our, our bullet crashes through it at more than the speed of sound. Now, we actually launch our bullets, for, for everybody I know of, is, is shooting bullets that are quote-unquote subsonic. But that's not technically quite right because aerodynamically, the region from about eight-tenths of the speed of sound to 1.2 times the speed of sound, that's Mach 0.8 to Mach 1.2, um, that's the transonic region. And that's a region that airplanes typically avoid because although, let's say the plane's going just below the speed of sound, as the air goes around the airframe, um, it's accelerated and so you can have air going faster than the speed of sound even though the plane as a whole isn't. And that results in little flickering shock waves all around the airframe and it's quite unstable. So usually what supersonic pilots will do is is blast through the transonic region as quickly as they can and, and life's good on the other side although it's got a lot of drag because of the shock waves you're making. Well the same thing's true with our little bullets. Um, here's the velocity profiles at 1075 feet per second. It's sort of a typical muzzle velocity of, of a 22 quote-unquote subsonic round and um, this isn't a stable situation. You know, I'll show you a little animation. As you watch, the, um, the shock waves are basically progressing down the bullet and, and constantly changing. So ideally, we wouldn't want to launch our bullet at, at this speed, but we sort of need to to get it to where it, it's going. And of course, the bullet's going to decelerate fairly rapidly as it goes down range. Um, if you want to see a, a really neat uh, physical video of this transonic shock um, situation, there's a YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day, which I highly recommend. And in one of the episodes, he does Schlieren photography of bullets. Most of them are, are supersonic, but in, towards the end of the video, he shoots a subsonic round and sees these... Um, these shockwaves appearing, even though the bullet is subsonic. It's pretty cool. I highly recommend it. Okay, enough of those pictures. So let's uh, start thinking about uh, the performance of the bullet. And a good way to start is to plot the amount of drag the bullet has versus how fast the bullet's going. And you know, typically this is done not versus speed of in feet per second or meters per second, but in terms of Mach number because everything interesting seems to happen right about Mach 1. And that's the case with this simulation here. The drag is basically stable or slightly increasing to get fairly close to Mach 1, and then it jumps way up. And that's because we're, to all the energy it takes to generate the shock waves, you know, basically is drag. Um, and so that's a, a very typical drag curve. Um, nothing magic about the Ely bullet. Um, now the part of the drag curve we're most interested in is, is the subsonic region. Um, and you can see it, it's, not, it's not one drag value. We, in order to model the bullet uh, well, we're going to need some sort of a curve there to account for the change in drag as the, the uh, bullet slows down. Before we get to that, let's, let me just fool around with, with the shape of the bullet a bit. I think you'll find this interesting. Um, one thing I did is I, I modified the Ely shape and made the nose more pointy, which sort of looks more streamlined, at least to my eye. Um, so this is an imaginary bullet, it doesn't exist, but just what would happen if you know, that was the case? And you know, lo and behold, the drag goes up, at least in the subsonic uh, region. So, you know, again, the, the shape of the Ely bu bullet is patented for a reason. They've got something pretty clever there. By the way, I'm not a spokesman for Ely. I just happened to shoot their ammo. Um, now, another thing I tried was, what if we got rid of the heel? It's sort of an unusual aspect of these bullets. And so what if they're, we just extended the, the Ely bullet uh, as if the casing were a larger diameter? And this turns out to be really bad. <laughs> it's worse in both the subsonic and supersonic regimes. So although it's funky, that, that little heel is actually helping us out. 
Um, so I couldn't resist. I mean, I, I can come up with a bullet which is lower drag than the, the basic Ely shape. The problem with this is the this pointy bullet design would be uh, quite unstable. The longer and skinnier you make a bullet, the less centrifugal uh, stability you have. And so I don't know at what distance this thing would start to tumble, but I don't recommend anybody go out and cast some. But anyway, it's sort of fun to simulate this thing. And one thing about that uh, bullet shape is when you do a supersonic simulation, you get a nice bow shock off the bullet. There's no cushion of air extending in front of the bullet anymore. So now you get a regular shock wave like you'd expect to see with a supersonic airplane or, or any supersonic bullet. And yes, indeed, this shape would have a lower drag um, than the Ely, which is, I'm glad I could come up with something. Um, so if it wasn't so unstable, you might be tempted to use it. But it turns out it's really not very useful, at least in the ranges I shoot, because here's a comparison of the drop um, of the regular Ely bullet versus this modified bullet, and it's hardly worth <laughs> paying attention to. So unless you were shooting really long distances, this kind of improvement really doesn't matter to us, which I found pretty interesting. Okay, just for fun, I, I simulated a CCI bullet. I, I mostly shoot this ammo in my pistol, but um, I've shot it in my rifle and it works fine. Uh, it does have a different shape, obviously, and um, it doesn't have that blunt front end, and it also has a sharper transition from the front of the bullet to the portion of the bullet that seats with the rifling. Um, and it, the simulation suggests that transition uh, generate shockwaves fairly early. And so here's the um, in comparison of the simulations. This isn't real data, it's simulated data, but I suggest that the drag curves are almost identical between the two bullets until you start getting close to the speed of sound and then the CCI shape um, would end up generating those shocks a bit earlier and stronger than the Ely and and so that curve kicks up uh, a bit sooner. Okay, enough on, on bullets. Let's get to um, to ballistics. Now, the the basic idea of a ballistic calculation is that the bullet is slowing down throughout its entire flight, and so we need to know the drag of the bullet, um, which is changing as the bullet you know, moves down range. So you don't want to use a single drag coefficient for the calculation. Now. Ideally, for every bullet we shot, we would have the drag at every single velocity and we'd be all set to go, but you know, that'd be extremely expensive to get that data. And so the approach people have taken is to use a model bullet where they do take a lot of data and then use that model as the basis for any other bullet which is similar. And so, you know, let's say our bullet is 10% higher drag than the model bullet. You just take the drag curve from the model bullet and, and drag it up, and now you've got an estimate of the drag of the bullet at all speeds. And that works well as long as the, the drag curve of the model bullet and yours are pretty similar, at least in the range we're interested in. And so let's look at some, some drag curves. Um, I'll start out with the, the G7 um, model. And by the way, I'm getting the values for these drag curves right out of Brian Litz's book. He has them in the, um, in the appendix, or in the back of the book. So the, the G7 model is based on a, a modern supersonic round that has a bow tail shape, and, um, which is quite different than the bullets we're shooting. But actually the drag curves are pretty similar. And particularly if you look at the subsonic region we're interested in, um, you imagine sliding the G7 up to match the um, Ely bullet, it's a pretty darn good match. And so I've used that and with good results and works just fine. Now Ely also, uh, in, their, in their documentation on their tech data sheet, um, mentions an RA4 ballistic model. And this is a model based on a heel bullet. And it's just spot on. If you compare the RA4 to the Ely match data, 
it's higher drag, but the shape's identical. So if you imagine dragging that RA4 shape down to the Ely match, um, that would be essentially a perfect fit. And so if your calculator or whatever you're using to do your, your uh, dope uh, has the RA4 model, that's a really good choice for 22. Unfortunately, the, you know, I tend to use my Kestrel because it's super convenient and has you know, all sorts of other features. Uh, so it doesn't have the RA4, so I've been using the, the G7 model. It works just fine. The one model which is um, prevalent, but frankly I just don't understand, is this old G1 model. And that's shown on the red here. And this is supposed to be the curve for this conventionally shaped bullet, but um, I don't think it's real. Uh, I suspect, you know, somebody may know the history of that and can fill it in in the comments, but my suspicion is this is prior to modern measurement techniques and modern understanding of shockwaves and whatnot, and uh, it's not close enough. So I, one thing I've learned from this is I won't use the G1 uh, ballistic model for anything, supersonic or subsonic, regardless of what the bullet looks like. I just don't think it's realistic. Anyway, um, so the, the approach I've taken for my dope, which is, uh, seems to work quite well, is first I measure the, the um, muzzle velocity of my, my gun using a, a chronograph, um, and then um, look up the, um, in my case, the G7 um, ballistic coefficient for the Ely bullet, which is published online. When I plug those two things into the Kestrel, or into any ballistic software, it seems to match my my own measurements um, within a click at every distance. Um, and if it didn't, you know, if it was a little off, I would probably just adjust the the ballistic coefficient um, a little bit to make it fit. But so far, I haven't needed to do that. Um, now, one thing I I don't want to you know waste your money, but I resisted buying a, a chronograph and. Uh, number of people told me I had to buy one, and they were right. Um, it's give you, for the two bullets I mentioned here, I've just written down what's written on the box in terms of velocity, and then what I've actually measured using this chronograph, and they're so far apart, it's just amazing. Um, and, you know, that's just because every gun is different. It's not a fault of the manufacturer or anything. Um, so you really don't know your um, your ballistics without knowing your muscle velocity, which is pretty obvious, but it took me a while to figure it out. Okay, well anyway, that's all I've got for you. I, I hope you enjoyed this and found it a little bit useful. Um, I'd welcome any comments that you have um, down below and hope to see you at the range. Mm -hmm.